Welcome to Voices of the Community, which explores critical issues facing Northern California communities. We introduce you to the voices of community thought leaders and change makers working on solutions facing our fellow community members, nonprofits, small businesses, neighborhoods, cities, and our region. This episode is part of our special series on how the arts and culture sector is coming back from the COVID-19 pandemic and features voices from our co-production of Arts for a Better Bay Area State of the Arts Summit on June 28, 2023. The focus of the summit was how artists and arts organizations are adapting in a post-pandemic marketplace, along with the economic developmental power of our arts and culture economy in rebuilding our communities. Just want to let everybody know, I've got a couple of people drifting in. We're waiting for one panelist to return for the bathroom, and then we'll get going. We don't have a lot of time today, so. But want to thank everyone for being here. My name is Katherine Reisner, and I'll be facilitating the panel. I'm also representing Vital Arts, which yep. was founded to honor the victims of the ghost ship fire by working to ensure access to safe, affordable houses, by safe, affordable space, housing, for artists to live, work, and perform. As we all know, and you're here, artist housing is a vitally important topic. A lack of safe, affordable housing has had a devastating impact on the arts ecosystem in the Bay Area. The topic is too big to be covered in one session and particularly in the lender an hour today. But we hope you'll be introduced to some resources and some ideas that will be helpful for you. I've also thrown a few brochures in the corner there from the East Bay that just came out from Berkeley side. We've given a lot of resources that will be digitally on, available on the web, including this one that's a specific guide to affordable housing in the East Bay. I should say, that the challenges of securing safe and affordable housing are multiple and complex. And those of you that have been dealing with it, no difficult, not easy, not easy to navigate. The issue is rooted in social and economic problems much larger than our sector. And the issues are those we share with elder, other vulnerable populations. So no one solution is going to solve all of it. And there are a diverse range of solutions and approaches that are needed to the problem. In addition to advocacy and information sharing and collaboration, which is what Vital Arts is engaged in, we also want to look at three areas that range in complexity, cost, and time. Adding housing by building new housing, rehabilitation of, or conversion of existing sites, preservation and legalization of existing live work. Work is being done in all these areas right now by a range of organizations. Take heart. There are projects going on. And today's panel will offer just a glimpse of the possibilities. We thank our panelists for joining us today. Mark Morissette will speak first. He's the facility director at Berkeley Repertory Theater, and he will discuss the home that they have built for their artists from the ground up. Joshua Simon, one of the founders of CAST, will offer a wider view after working on affordable housing development from varied organizations for more than 50 years, as well as some suggestions for the future. And Ian Winters of Northern California Land Trust, who is also a practicing artist, and Meg Schiffler of the Artist Space Trust, will speak to a newer strategy for securing artist community control and long-term affordability that's been adapted from the social housing justice movements of community land trusts. Each of our panelists has chosen to define and address specific problems within the larger set of challenges. They will each speak to five to seven minutes and we ask that you hold your questions until the end. There will be time for questions. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Morissette, Facilities Director for the Berkeley Repertory Theater and one of the project managers for a current building project we just finished called the Medic Center, which is a uh, workforce housing building uh, located in Berkeley in downtown. The arts district. <clears throat> I have some prepared remarks, so I'll just read through this if uh, I'll get started here. So the, the Medic Center is a building named for uh, a retired managing director named Susie Medic, and it's a seven-story, uh, 46,000 square foot building 
uh, with 45 studio apartments. $32 million housing building is was built on a 10,000 square foot lot right next door to our theaters in the downtown area. We broke ground in 2019 in October, and then we uh, promptly were shut down in March of 2020. We resumed construction in March of 2021, and we just finished the construction in September of 2022, nine months ago. Along with the 45 studio apartments that we have, we also have multiple use classroom for our school of theater. And we have a workshop performance space on the lower floor of the new, for new work development. We also have an outdoor terrace for receptions and events. And currently there's a big vegetable garden that's planted out there. The primary purpose of our building is to provide housing for our continuous rotation, rotation of actors, directors, designers, and artistic staff for our 10, seven to 10 theatrical productions and programs each year, including our upcoming three-week summer playwright workshop this July. It's also the home for 15 young artist professionals who are awarded fellowships every year in their artistic discipline. The typical stay for an actor and the designers are about three to four months while they're, we're in production of their production and about nine months to one year for the artistic fellows. If we have extra capacity, we intend to rent the rooms to other nonprofits at a market rate to generate much needed income to cover our operating costs. Prior to opening this building, the Berkeley Rep leased out about 25 apartments around Berkeley to house our actors and our fellows. Over the course of the past several years, we saw the expense skyrocket over 250% from about $350,000 a year to more than $1.4 million annually. In order to get a control of these costs, the board and staff started planning about 10 years ago to work on a workforce housing building, and we've been doing that for the past 10 years, and that resulted in the construction. We conducted a feasibility study and determined what, would what, would, what we could do to accomplish and support the building with the following factors. First, we needed to finance the building with the current operating costs that we were investing in the apartments around town. We already owned the property, valued at almost $2, 000, I mean $2 million, which was right next door to our two theaters, so we didn't have to purchase property. And then we engaged contractors to work on this project and to value engineer it. And what value, value engineering is, is we selected a contractor and then with the idea that they would help us try to find the least expensive ways to build in a process. As an example, if the architect uh, spec'd a, a certain floor, we would talk to the subcontractor and they would oftentimes come forward with a, a comparable floor that had the same quality but had much lower cost materials. Through this process, we think we saved about a million dollars in our construction costs. We also worked really well with the local city government. This was to get our building fees lowered whenever we could. This was to figure out ways to work around some of the requirements and get some fees waived and even deferred to pay at a later date. We utilized our community contacts to speed up approvals of different other necessities such as utilities, such as PG&E and water, uh, in order to get those long delays shortened so it would lower our construction cost also. We also work with the architect to design a modest yet very elegant design of residential units to be flexible so we could have the opportunity for mixed usages at the same time. One of the goals is to be able to rent the excess occupancy to other nonprofits when available. And uh, so what did we learn in this process that we can share with other arts organizations? One is to build strong relationships with government officials. This helps us negotiate use permits and resolving construction issues and fees. Also to engage a strong group of bankers, real estate professionals, 
architects, lawyers, construction professionals to help us guide the project. Some of these people we used were board members, others were patrons and friends that we added to our facilities committee that met on a regular monthly basis for the last several years. Also, we knew that there was gonna be uh, kinks and problems that had to get worked out before, during, and after the building. It wasn't a matter of if there was gonna be problems, it was a matter of when those problems arose, how were we gonna problem solve? <clears throat> and the three of the best practices that we could offer up would be to raise the private capital as affordable housing costs can't be constructed without subsidies. Uh, also, number two, in a mixed use building, find ways to integrate usages, usages and access for security and efficiencies. And finally, identify other organizations to partner with either on the development side of the project or in the final uses of the project. Thanks for letting me share that with you. Josh. Okay. Uh, there's no way I can tell you in five to seven minutes um, how we can build affordable housing. I think, as Mark said, it's a team sport. So it's very important to put together a team around what you're doing. But first, we have to sort of define what you're doing in terms of what type of housing, because there's many different types. Um, let me just start off with my background. I've been doing this since about 1982. I worked with Project Arto to get them legal and worked with arts organizations around the country in the National Art Space Development Network. Uh, we built about 2,000 apartments at East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation, Ibalsi, uh, as well as mixed-use um, uh, including Swan's Market and others, uh, co-housing, um, uh, shared housing. Um, and in all of this, building healthy neighborhoods requires looking at how to anchor people in the neighborhood with different needs, both housing and we're learning from the pandemic how we work. And now we work at home. So... It's even though I've worked on lots of different kinds of housing, the housing we need now is yet again different because how we live is different and how we work is different. So there's a housing movement looking at doing this work. So about two years ago, I sort of semi retired from Ibalsi, where I had worked for about 20 years to work with CAST, Community Arts Stabilization Trust. And CAST was set up to fill the gap in that team building effort to how do you put together a team. We initially start off with facilities because most nonprofits are really good at what you do and what we do, but Exotic finance isn't one of the <laughs> programs. <laughs> and quite frankly, you, real estate can be so all-consuming, organizations report that they are choosing between their art and figuring out where they're going to do their art. So working with the city of San Francisco and, and foundations, we came up with this idea, is why don't we create a bridge why don't we create a way that we can partner with organizations that are, you know, just becoming real estate ready, but they're not ready to drop everything they're doing for two or three years to figure out a building. And how can we partner with those organizations to help them build equity so that in five, seven, ten years, when, the, when they, their art and their organization is built up, they can either choose to buy us out and continue, or they can choose, you know, other, other things. But the main question the folks that we've been working with has been asking us is, this is great to help us with facilities. And we, we worked with CounterPulse and, and I, I could, you can go to our website and see a whole list of groups, but where do the people who work with us live? And I've heard of some groups who have, who have closed because all the people who worked for them left town. And so organizations are struggling with where, where's our workforce? So 
we began working with a former colleague of mine, CJ Carolyn Johnson, at Black Cultural Zone to look at how do we create sort of a housing, community facilities, economic development model where we took a city-owned lot and we're building 120 affordable apartments, seven of which are designed specifically for artist housing and for, for folks who are working at home and have work at home businesses, but also setting up collaboration space on the ground floor so residents can express their art, their culture, small business, economic development. And if that begins to take off, we have a 30,000 square foot retail food, sort of like a new version of Swan's Market, a more Afrocentric version that's tied into that neighborhood, where those businesses can move and be fostered and have resources. So looking at how do we build an ecology where affordable housing isn't just a place you stay, it's a place you stay and work and build a business and raise a family and you know build the economic resources for for the next step. The creative economy I've learned in California's got the biggest one of the biggest economies in the world. I think we're number eight. Seven percent of that is the creative economy. So we, if we're going to address uh, racial equity and if we're going to address opportunity and if we're going to really be full communities regardless, so opportunities aren't tied to income and place, how do we create housing that helps people move into into the creative economy and into other small businesses and economic development? We're now looking at another version where there would be housing with a workshop space down below. I'd love to get your advice on, on it. We don't have all the answers. All of you have pieces of the answer. So I'm, I'm asking you to start a conversation in this moment where retail is going to the internet and office has changed its nature. We have an opportunity, as Maria was saying earlier, to change the paradigm and to look at affordable housing as an engine for economic development in possibly in some of the office buildings. So I look forward to speaking with you guys about it further. Thank you. Okay. Diane and Meg. I'm Ian Winters, I'm one of the co-founders of the Artist Space Trust, along with Catherine, and also here with a couple of different hats. You know, I know a lot of you in this room as a working artist, and also executive director at Northern California Land Trust for. 20 years and like Josh have stepped into a role, new role as director of incubation and special projects, helping, helping mentor and bring the artist space trust to life. So echoing and sort of following up on what Josh was saying about a community, one of the, one of the critical things and a critical piece of a community land trust, which is what the Northern California land trust is, is that community piece and that none of us have all of the answers. So, you know, just as an example, there are many, many, many organizations, you know, this is one panel organized by one group organizing one conference. Just want to name some of the, some of our other colleagues in the East Bay who do great work. Like Josh mentioned, the, the, the phenomenal things that Black Cultural Zone is doing in East Oakland, East Side Culture Alliance. There's East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, whom we've also collaborated on a project that actually houses a bunch of artists as well. There is Safer DIY Spaces, which has helped preserve many, many, many industrial and sort of artist, artist-run warehouse spaces that may or may not exist. You would have to ask them to confirm that. And you know, it's just a myriad of other organizations. There's other CLTs. Richmond Land, the Vallejo Community Land Trust that's emerging, Oak CLT, San Francisco Community Land Trust, and the South Bay, the South Bay Community Land Trust is working on some of its first projects. So I just want to highlight how much this is a community endeavor in many, 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 many communities. It's not one community. It's about finding 
the sort of critical community and culturally specific way in to understand how do we how do we actually take control of our real estate and make there be space for culture so thinking about that that how do we keep keep and bring wealth into the arts and into the communities where it usually gets vacuumed out of one one of the the kind of visions of the artist space trust is during the pandemic Catherine and I were talking and realizing there's a generational shift afoot in the Bay Area. There's an entire generation of artists who moved to the Bay Area and really helped make it what it is of, you know, built on an arrow when you could buy a building in West Oakland or in the Dog Patch. And today, those studio spaces and homes and all those places that artists built, those, you know, those are people who now are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and there's a generational change going on. And those, the loss of those spaces is, will be an incredible loss to the cultural wealth and the economic wealth of the arts and culture sector and of the communities. Because those are community places and community hubs, even though they may be privately owned. So one of the, the sort of vision of AST is in collaboration with groups like CAST and municipal organizations and traditional funding, but is how do we help preserve this sort of private cultural capital? that is really community centric where you know people don't always have children or they may not want to you know they know that if they leave this studio to their children who aren't artists it's going to get sold and split up that's great they get some money but it's not going to be an art space it's not going to like there's going to be a, a heart go out of the community because of that so the vision is how do we bring using the community land trust model which helps keep things permanently affordable because the community land trust owns the land and an individual artist household or organization uh, can own the building, but at an affordable price. How can we keep all those spaces affordable and keep that wealth in the community and let, you know, sort of artists, artists do one of the things they do best, which is really help ourselves. I think that's about my half of time. <laughs> And Mick. It's like we're speed dating. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to see so many familiar faces. And um, I'm Meg Schiffler. I'm the inaugural director of Artist Space Trust after 17 years at the San Francisco Arts Commission. And so I'm very happy to be moving into a regional project that will support artists all across the broader Bay Area. I am long-winded. I'm going to stick to my notes so I stay on track, but happy to field any questions afterwards. So one of the things that attracted me to Artist Space Trust was that Catherine and I had already done the groundwork of meeting all of these older artists who were literally saying, take my home. I want to start a legacy with the biggest asset that I have. I don't have children or my kids are doing fine or... I'm thinking more about artists than my kids, <laughs> whatever it is. They're actually bequesting, um, which means donating their homes to us. And so single family homes, potentially live workspaces, potentially larger studios. We are the first community land trust in the nation that's solely entirely focused on artists' housing and creative space. And so this is a model that I'm excited to grow here in the Bay Area with Catherine and Vital Arts and Northern California Land Trust and all of the experts and colleagues, both in the arts and in the affordable housing world in the Bay Area, but also to take this model into other communities and teach other communities how to do this in Seattle, in Portland, in place, other cities where artists are not able to afford to live, especially by. See, I'm already off my notes. Okay, back to the notes. Artist Space Test is starting a portfolio of properties through bequests of homes from elder artists and non-artists, the donation of properties, and eventually we'll move into, once we have an acquisition fund, of below market rate purchases of properties. These properties will be permanently, I'm going to keep using the word permanent, permanently removed from the speculative market and made permanently affordable for artists. It preserves space for artists all across the Bay in individual homes and in small units. You know, 
multi-unit buildings, and also studio space. This means that we're preserving a presence of arts and culture throughout a variety of neighborhoods in the, in, in the Bay Area, which are flipping right now. So this is really important. Another thing is that a community land trust is a nonprofit. So we'll have an advisory council and then eventually once we come out of our pilot phase, perhaps a, you know, a board of directors made up of artists and affordable housing experts and also tenants from the buildings that will be part of the portfolio. As the properties, here's where it comes to you guys as artists, as the properties, which are single family homes, live workspaces, condo or co-op housing, studio space, as they become available, we'll have com a competitive process. You'll have to qualify under affordable housing financial qualifications, usually at an 80% AMI. You can Google that for the Bay Area. And then we'll also be matching the property to an artist's needs personally and professionally. We've got a house with lots of bedrooms and a ceramic studio in the back. That should probably go to maybe a family with kids or be broken up into a co-op situation for people that are going to utilize the ceramic studio. That's just an example. We'll have all sorts of properties that have all sorts of unique features. And then, yeah, the preservation of cultural communities. Let's say this house is deeply rooted and has been a hub for a specific cultural community. We'll be very sensitive to that and perhaps even partner with local nonprofits to make sure that preservation happens. Got a couple more things. AST will help artists gain equity. This is a purchase situation that we're starting off with. We'll get into rental properties eventually, but this is about you being able to gain equity through the purchase of a house. The community land trust owns the land. It's going to be affordable and you get to start building your equity. You also will have housing stability, and we're going to root artists in various communities across the Bay, like I said. And Two as the first Meg. time, what? Two minutes. Oh, I'm good. As the first community land trust in the country, we really look forward to building our success here, providing this housing. You know, I think when I took the job, because I know so many people, I got texts and emails from over 100 artists. And they're like... I need a place to stay. I need stability. This particular project is just one of many. And it's not a project where right away we're going to get a building with 100 units. That's, we're going to grow. Give us a little time. I've been here four months and Catherine and I have been talking about it for a couple of years. And we're just now piloting and building. Maybe we'll get there to these larger units. In the meantime, we're going to take advantage of this generational shift. I had a call about a month ago and didn't even know how to respond from a woman who literally said, okay, I'm in Berkeley. I'm older. I'm estate planning. I've got two small multi-unit housing spaces and a performance space. You want them? Like literally this is happening on and if not a daily, a weekly basis. It's incredible. So thank your elders. Encourage them, if you know someone with a home, to contact us if they're ready to start a legacy. And know that we're trying to root artists here permanently. When the house, when the new artist goes into the house, when they leave it, comes back to the trust, and a new artist goes in. So this will outlive Ian and Catherine and I on into the future thrilled to be working on this project and being in the learning curve that I'm at right now. <laughs> so thank you. Follow us on social media. We have a brand new website and we'll list all of our opportunities on the website, on Instagram, Facebook, and what's the job search one? LinkedIn. That's me. Thank you. <laughs>
new voices are celebrated and artists and audiences inclusive of the Bay Area's diverse communities and cultures have opportunities to thrive. To find out more, go to zff.org and buy a grant from the Peaceful World Foundation dedicated to fostering a culture of global peace through the promotion of hosted conversations and education. You can learn more at peacefulworldfoundation.org. Before we get back to our state of the arts breakout session on the development of housing for the creative workforce with our arts and culture organizations, we wanted to share an excerpt from one of our one-on-one interviews with the keynote speakers and summit guest. This excerpt features Julie Baker, the CEO of both Californians for the Arts and California Arts Advocates, who updates us on a new state law focused on promoting more affordable housing for our creative workforce. So we wanted to invite you back to the show so that you could walk us through the groundbreaking California state law AB 812, which promotes affordable housing for artists working in cultural districts that Julie's team have advocated for and was authored by assembly member Tasha Berner and was just signed by Governor Gavin Newsom. So Julie, let's start with you providing a little background on why your team and assembly member Berner created AB 12, and then why was it created, if you will, as well as who does it serve? Absolutely. So last year, the there was a coalition of legislators who did a tour of the cultural districts. So there are 14 state designated cultural districts under the California Arts Council, our state arts agency. The cultural district program was actually signed into law in 2016 or 2017, about that. And uh, 2016. And then the the 14 pilots were um, created about 2017, 2018. So it's been several, several years. In the most recent budget, there was um, an, an appropriation of funding for the 14, right? So legislators were interested to see what was happening in these districts, and they did some tours. And there's 14, then there's several that are in rural communities and many in urban communities around the state of California. When they did this, one of the consistent things that they heard was how, as we know, artists create community, right? They help build a community's economic base, its livability, its vibrancy, its sense of belonging, all the wonderful things that we know artists and cultural bearers do in community. And then what happens is they get displaced. So we know this. This has been a consistent thing within our history in the United States. And in particular, we know that there's a housing crisis in California. So Assemblymember Borner, Tasha Borner from San Diego, introduced the concept of ensuring that in a state, city, or county designated cultural district, there would be within affordable housing, at least up to 10% would be reserved for artists in those city, county, state designated cultural districts. It's not going to change everything and or solve all the problems, but it starts to socialize the problem, right? So that was number one. This is addressing an issue that needs to be talked about by the legislature and lifted up to the administration. So we were really thrilled that the governor signed it. One of the things that it signals, I hope, to artists and folks who are inside of cultural districts is that the administration and the legislature recognize that artists who build communities are now having a difficult time living in the communities that they help to build. This is starting to address the problem. It's not going to address all of the problems because we already know that affordable housing is a very small percentage of what's happening in communities. So then you're talking up to 10% of that, but it's starting. So we're really thrilled that the assembly member uh, authored this. Our lobbying organization, California Arts Advocates, was the sponsor. So we did multiple hearings where we testified on behalf of this bill. And we used a lot of research. And I, I want to state this, George, because I think it's important for people, people to hear this, too. There's a lot of research and people are sort of like, why are people funding research all the time? Well, it's really, really critical that data helps to inform these types of decisions. We utilize this data to help inform why this bill is necessary. And what they found was that artists and artist cultural workers disproportionately rent their living space, which is 71%. Of those who rent, 77% are rent burdened or severely rent burdened based on the California Department of Housing and Community Development definitions. So between that and other data that we were able to 
all of the anecdotal stories that they were hearing when they made these visits to cultural districts. And of course, any testimony that we were able to also give uh, throughout the process, we now have AB 812 as law in the state of California. And as you know quite well, there's hundreds of them in California. Can other cultural districts you know, say, for example, San Francisco has the historical theater district, you know, around the city Goldstein, SF Jazz, the Opera House, et cetera. Can they use this tool? Yes, they can. It's actually intended for city, county and state designated cultural districts. And the other thing that is in there is actually it's also within a certain um, radius of a cultural district. And it's a half a mile from a state within a one half mile from a state designated cultural district, because sometimes, you know, they're spread out. Uh, So I think absolutely can be utilized. And I also want to clarify The 14 that were um, designated by the California Arts Council in the program are not managed by the California Arts Council. They are then self-managed within community. And so, you know, they they certainly help convene and and provide uh, funding and support. But these are self-managed cultural districts. And you're right. There are hundreds. In fact, one of this is the next research we need to do is to understand how many cultural districts are there in the state of California. We we only know for sure of the 14. We know anecdotally. We know about uh, you know black cultural districts in certain com- you know communities across California uh, and so on. And we also want to recognize how much this is not only a community development model, but an economic development model. When we have these concentrations of arts and culture, you have a healthier community. But what we want to ensure is that the people who make that happen can afford to live in those communities, can afford to work in those communities, and are not forced to um, have to commute back into the community in which they work, in which they help to build the vibrancy and the economic uh, impact for. So does AB uh, 812 provide any funding and what other tools? It is not a funding mechanism. It's really just uh, a a signal to uh, city, county, state government, or mostly it's really a local mandate, right? So affordable housing is done to ensure that when you're starting this process, that if it's in a cultural district, city, county, or state designated cultural district, that up to to 10% of that affordable housing is maintained for artists. Now, if artists are not able to utilize that, and we have specific definitions of artists, which we ensured was because a lot of times, particularly in state government, they may think of artists as just a visual artist. So this is the full array, array of what how an artist is defined in terms of performing arts, literary arts, and so on, as you will see in the definition. So we wanted to ensure that that was in there as well. So that's really the role of advocacy is to make sure that you know state government has great intentions. We want to make sure that it actually mirrors what we're seeing in the field and what the needs are. But in this case, you know, I think that the next step, now that the governor has just signed the bill, would be to start to think about how do we create uh, local advocacy for when these things are, are going to happen. So the first step then would be we need to asset map how many cultural districts there are in the state of California, alert all of those cultural districts to this bill to recognize that they have this mechanism to ensure that there's affordable housing for artists and and retained in their communities and then build that system. So as always, you know, getting the bill signs just the first step, there's always more work to be done. So if I was an artist or a local, you know, uh, government, you know, officials or staff person, who is you know working or living in a cultural district, local or officially state, how could I get engaged? Where would I go? How would I support this? How would I educate myself more? I mean, right, you can certainly look up the, the legislation it's itself, AB 812. It's not particularly, some legislation's pages and pages long. It's not particularly long. You can um, just utilize that. What's important is that for advocates in city, county, state designated cultural districts or people who are in those and the artists that are in those to understand that this is for them. So if you're hearing about affordable housing being built in your community, you need to ensure that you walk in and say, legislation was just signed by the governor that ensures up to 10 percent. What are you doing to mandate this? And talk to your city or county officials about that. It's going to take education. It's going to take that level of advocacy. So part of our work, it will be to, again, we have to identify where all of these are 
and then start to really make sure that they're aware of this opportunity. Great. So I know you and your team at California Arts Advocates and Californians for the Arts are always uh, working and developing legislation in um, the background. So where can folks go to stay in the loop on your team's legislative work? Yeah. So as of uh, today, uh, October 18th, still go to californiansforthearts.org. It'll still always be our website, but soon we'll launch also California Arts Advocates.org, which is our C4. So you will really start to see the different areas of what the work is that we're doing. They can always reach out to me. I'm Julie at californiansforthearts.org. So there's lots of ways for folks to engage. And we really do want to hear from the field because uh, obviously this is this is the work of, by, and for the field. And we're not there to speak for you. We're there to speak with you. Thanks for being on the show, Julie. Thanks, George. Let's get back to our State of the Arts breakout panel discussion on how arts and real estate organizations are both innovating and iterating how to preserve housing and create new housing for artists and our creative workforce. Thank you to all of our speakers. We are going to take questions now, and we're going to ask that each person asking a question take the mic because we are recording this so that you can be properly recorded along with your question. So questions from the audience. Hello. I'm Shana Pete. I'm with Center for Excellence in Nonprofits. And really happy to be here uh, in support of the arts today because I know that um, we do com- capacity building for the nonprofit space and arts often get left out of that. So really glad to be here and to hear the panel. Um, I'm curious with the work that you're doing, particularly at AST, what steps are you taking to build in equitable practices as you do this work, especially when you're dealing with legacy and you know, we often have a picture of what probably the community that you're looking like, the people who call up and say, I've got three properties. They maybe didn't grow up in a time or in a space necessarily where they're having conversations like we are now. So I'm curious what you're doing. I think this was really carefully considered by Ian and Catherine as they founded this. And so Ian and I were just talking about it yesterday. I'm going to pass this to you. And fill in. Yeah. Okay. So one of the I would say one of the things that we've been thinking about from the very beginning is who are the who are the people we're bringing in as advisors. So this is this is an idea that we sort of like we're both people that cook up ideas, and oh well, then you have to build them and make them real. And both of us have large networks across you know the arts community, and so we're now in the phase of bringing you know before there are any buildings, we're we're not. We're not accepting anything right now. We're saying we will be, but we'll put together a great advisory board so far and building in more people. And, you know, one of the things we NCLT does as part of incubating organizations is it's usually about a two year process. And we go through a really focused equity and planning process of doing a tremendous number of kind of you know, focus groups for lack of a better word, but, you know, a lot of one on a lot of one on one and group meetings reaching out to sort of all the stakeholders in the different communities we're working with. Um, Because, you know, we work with a lot of different communities and not everyone. Sometimes we look exactly like the community we're working with, and sometimes we look nothing like them. And, you know, that's, that's a key piece of the work is how do we meet people and make sure that that voice is really embedded and embedded in the the structure and the fabric of the eventual organization. So it's not just a oh we want to do the right thing, but there's actually a long a long term curatorial and selection process that is that is sort of baked baked into the DNA. So that it's not it's not one person in an office choosing who gets this. It's a community wide selection process that's really you know rooted in people's desires and. You know, I think we've also had some very intentional, you know, conversations. I'll pass it on to, to Catherine, you know, letting people know that it, they're, they're not actually in control of who gets their house. Um, Wanted to point that out because we're very conscious. You may be aware this is the largest intergenerational transfer of wealth in American history is going on right now. And as this, everybody can pretty well tell, the group that's passing on the wealth looks nothing like the population looks now 
or like the, the artist population in particular in the Bay Area. So this is definitely a strategy that will shift that wealth. And we've been very clear with people who want to give the legacy, they will not have a say-so. The advisory committee, people have agreed to date are up on our website. They are well-known artists, arts practitioners from the Bay Area. Right now, it's 100% BIPOC, and rep we're making it even more representative as we add more people. But community land trusts, by their nature, are community-led and driven. So the voices of those people, they will be guiding the design of the selection process. They will be guiding the type of buildings that we decide to take on, where the needs are, what kind of properties make sense, looking at the price points, et cetera. So it's very, very intentional. It comes from a history you know, that, that is very, very much about keeping people in communities rooted and countering gentrification and loss of community to marginalized populations or people that have not been had the wealth, the idea is to pass it over and, and make this shift. So it's, it's an exciting prospect. Did that answer your question? Can we grab a little printer? Is it a tag on to that? With the, with the mic. Please oh, use the yeah. mic. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Are you, and to that point, are you able to, are you thinking about how to make sure that the communities where people are taking new route are included in the community? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Very good point. Thank you. Should have mentioned that. There are rules that we have to follow for affordable housing. But if you take examples of government money that's passed through something like the Arts Commission, they are able to specify communities that that money goes to. Or an artist specifically working with a community from inside of a community. It's like it's sort of this creative language and this creative way to make sure that that happens, but stay within the guidelines of affordable housing. Denise, who runs the, Denise Pate, who runs the San Francisco Arts Commission grants program is here. And I, I think it's a conversation at the Arts Commission about how best to take that government money that might have these restrictions around it and make sure that you figure out how it gets where it needs to go. There's a whole series of yeah. tools such as the right of return ordinances that San Francisco and, and Oakland have both passed and, and being able to build that into the housing selection process. It's very important to set it up so that there's not inadvertent discrimination in the system, but at the same time to recognize the historic discrimination that was there. And the housing communities worked very hard to find tools, and the housing community still working, particularly rental housing, to find tools to address those inequities. And again, I think these conversations are really important to have because we're always missing something, and those those rules always need to be tweaked and worked on. The municipalities need to recognize artists as a specific demographic a specific demographic that has specific needs and name it. You know, you can do it for teachers. You can do it for a variety of folks that are, um, you know, keeping the integrity of our city alive and vital and can't afford to live there. And you have to name it. You have to call it out. And it has to be specifically. You cannot, in the state of California, if you're using government money, you cannot discriminate by employment unless it's specifically sanctioned as in the case of educators. Mm -hmm. So you can't require somebody to be an artist, but you can have housing that gives preferences for people who do art regardless of their employment. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of nuance to it and would be glad to talk further about it. Mm -hmm. We're always trying to figure out how to do it better. This, this conversation could go on. We've got another question in just a few more minutes. Um, uh, so two short questions. One, I was very excited to hear about the prospect of housing being built in the downtown area. That's something that everybody's like, I hope with all the empty spaces and the buildings they become. But how realistic is that? And, you know, how, how, and, and it's not a criticism. It's me saying, I'm super excited about that. But it seems like there are a lot of roadblocks 
for anything like that to happen in the immediate future. So I'm curious about how, um, how no, possible it, that is. I think it's it, it's as possible as we together make it. It will require advocacy. It will require coming together to push to make it happen. So this won't happen if just a developer comes. I mean, it might, but depending on a lot of factors. But there are a lot of ro uh, roadblocks, as you say. So organizing is important. And at the same time, it has been done in other parts of the state. So there's not a reason it can't be done. And we're in this bizarre moment. CAST was born when real estate prices dropped dramatically in 2007, 2008. And I thought I'd never see another time like this in my life. Suddenly, shopping centers and office buildings are selling for a fraction of what they were. So we have a very small window, maybe a year or two, maybe, to organize. And it's, it's good to see some of my other colleagues from the nonprofit sector here. It's going to take all of the tools we've built over the last 40 or 50 years in community development to pull this off. It's not an easy thing to do. So I'm not saying this is easy, but if we're all in alignment, if we can all come together around it, I do think we can take down some of these buildings and turn them into engines for economic development. We've got a project in Berkeley. There's a Berkeley Artist Housing Task Force that's been working for two years to get the city to agree. That they keep asking developers who are putting up these brand new buildings with market rate housing. They keep requiring that they put retail on the ground floor. So you've all seen the phenomenon of empty retail along all these new things. We've been pushing for, can't we have affordable artists live work on the ground floor to count toward affordable housing requirements, which developers would love to see. We're also looking at empty retail. We've done surveys of main avenues. And um, thank you for the time uh, alert. And uh, so we're working on it. We've got two projects right now sitting in city planning department where a developer just got tired of waiting. He put in two proposals for two housing buildings with artists live work on the ground floor, which be part of the development as counting toward affordable housing. City saying, whoa, whoa, we don't know how to deal with this, et cetera, et cetera. We've got a, a hearing coming up in a couple of weeks before the housing commission to try and deal with some of the roadblocks and some of the language and some of the vocabulary and the targets and so forth and so on. So we're in the middle of that right now in Berkeley. And we've been working at it for a while. Like Josh, I'm optimistic it can happen, but we all have to get involved. Thank you. And the last question is, I appreciated your example about the house with the pottery wheel. And I'm wondering if the same sort of thematic considerations, so to speak, could be applied to housing that that exists in various areas. So, you know, trans artists getting housing in the trans arts district or, you know, API artists in the Asian arts district or whatnot. If that same sort of consideration is possible, being considered, et cetera. It's, I think for the reasons we were discussing earlier, it's hard to do it with state housing regulations. But certain, you know, we are this. That's a longer conversation about ways to try and do that. It's definitely something we've been spending a lot of time talking about. There is a much larger coalition called the Race and Equity and All Planning Coalition here in the city. And it is a coalition of tenant organizers, affordable housing developers, and some of the cultural districts in the city that have a people's plan. So when we talk about very specifically San Francisco and what can we actually rally behind as an arts community, the people's plan for housing, which has actually been developed by community members and includes things like cultural districts as responses to gentrification and very specifically how do we use the cultural districts as, as a response and as a pushback against gentrification, so the Race and Equity and All Planning Coalition, it is a member organization, so it's hard to get in because they do require people to be accountable to their communities in order to be a part of, of it. But there is going to be a series of actions very specifically on July 11th in relation to the San Francisco housing element and the San Francisco Planning Commission has to have 
uh, public meeting. So they're having a big public meeting on July 11th at the San Francisco County Building. The Rep Coalition right now is organizing a action outside of that. And also in the People's Plan, arts and culture is a main tentpole tenet of how we fight for land use and appropriate land use in the city. So the Race and Equity All Planning Coalition and the Citywide People's Plan. Thank you for sharing that. That's yeah. one of the reasons we're all here is to learn and see what else we can support. Thank you so much. I think we have time for one more question. Hello, thank you. Is this on? Can you all, can you all hear me? Okay. Um, my name is Newt King. I'm not here with any organization. I'm just a working class artist who stumbled across this event. I was curious, we've opened this whole you know, summit with um, land recognition and things like that. So I'm curious what land trusts are doing to ensure that indigenous people are included in these conversations and moving beyond equity, but like repatriation, rematriation, restoration of land to indigenous peoples who may not necessarily be federally, federally recognized tribes. Well, so there's there's a whole statewide organization called the California Community Land Trust Network. There's a number of indigenous-led organizations that are that are essentially CLTs or community land trusts. They they take a slightly different form that's more sort of community specific. But that that is one of the the main vehicles inside that statewide kind of organizing coalition and kind of activism center. Is you know if you Look at the California CLT network site. That's you'll you'll learn a whole bunch about what's happening in that space. And then separate from that, a lot of individual CLTs, you know, are made up organizations that are made up of community members and organizers. And a lot of those people are indigenous and native peoples. And you know, it's a tremendously tremendously broad coalition of people who make up the community land trust movement. So for example, here in the Bay Area, NCLT, we have one of our projects that's actually, we turned over to Segurite Land Trust in Oakland. And so that's an Ohlone-led land trust that's you know working working on a, a whole sort of plan of rematriation and in creating a series of gardens and ceremonial spaces. And so that's that's one of the other ways you can you can sort of directly address that is really work with work with one of the organizations that already already exists and contribute to it. They have a whole sort of land tax philosophy. I don't know if you know about it. So if you look up their land trust their website, Segorite Land Trust, you'll you'll learn a tremendous about about what's happening in, in the East Bay. And I don't think there's anything directly comparable in San Francisco, but I know the East Bay better than San Francisco in that regard. Okay, I think we are right at time. I'm sorry we have to cut this off. I feel like <laughs> we're barely skimming the surface. We have given the organizers a long list of resources and that you will find online and other organizations that are doing really good work that you should know about because... There are so many other groups with great, great projects that should be in this room. But I think what I'm hopeful is that just starting to hear a little bit and then learning about stuff, all of us can lend our energy to backing each other and supporting uh, these efforts because it really is going to take every single one of us working not only within the arts community, but with in the larger group of residents in our communities that are fighting for affordable housing and really trying to reverse what we've seen has taken so much from us. So I wanted to just leave on a power note of hope in that this, there is more going on than you think. People that were mentioned today, I know of artist housing be, being built right now by some of the groups that were mentioned and some others that were not. So there are efforts being you know happening. And I, I'm hopeful that if we focus and really make a lot of noise, we'll see things very differently in 10 years. Thank you all for being here. That's it for this episode of Voices of the Community. You've been listening to the voices of Catherine Reisner, Executive Consultant with Final Arts, Mark Morizetti, the Facilities Director at Berkeley Repertory Theater, 
Joshua Simon, a senior advisor at the Community Arts Stabilization Trust, Ian Winters, the Director of Incubation and Special Projects at the Northern California Land Trust, and Meg Schiffler, the Director of Artist Space Trust, all in with Julie Baker, the CEO of Californians for the Arts and California Arts Advocates. To find out more information about our guests and their respective organization's programs, services, how to volunteer, and to make a donation, please go to VoicesOfTheCommunity.com and click on the link to the Arts and Culture series and Episode 4, Housing for the Artist Workforce, Revisiting Artist Housing Solutions. While you're on our website, you can both watch or listen to the full episodes and one-on-one interviews of our Arts and Culture series, along with signing up for our newsletter to stay up to date on future shows. After watching and listening to these wonderful stories, we hope that you will consider making a donation and volunteering to support our arts and culture organizations and our arts and culture workforce. Today's episode was made possible through our co-production partnership with Arts for a Better Bay Area for their State of the Arts Summit, along with our amazing technical crew. The audio and video wizard and our associate producer, Eric Estrada, and our co-production partner, Bayback Media, and their wonderful staff, Paula Argoni, Andy Konami, Issa Nakazawa, Siobhan Giles, and Melanie Ayala. The graphics magic was made possible by Casey Nance from Citron Studios. Voices of the Community is supported by a grant from the Sellerbach Family Foundation, whose arts and culture grants ensure vibrant work is created, new voices are celebrated, and artists and audiences inclusive of the Bay Area's diverse communities and cultures have opportunities to thrive. To find out more, go to zff.org and buy a grant from the Peaceful World Foundation, dedicated to fostering a culture of global peace, the promotion of hosted conversations and education. You can learn more at peacefulworldfoundation.org. We'd also like to thank our broadcast partners, KSFP 102.5 FM, KPCA 103.3 FM, Petaluma Community TV, and Bayback Media. Take us along in your next walk, workout, or drive by subscribing to Voices of the Community on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast. If you've been enjoying the show, please leave us a rating and review on the podcast platform of your choice, and we'd love to hear from you with feedback and show ideas, so send us an email to george at georgecoster.com. I'm George Coster from San Francisco, and thank you for listening and watching today's episode.